Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and today I will be talking about one of the most popular episodes of Murder, She Wrote. This was suggested to me by countless people on social media and in the comments, and it's one I've remembered for years due to its long-winded title. Who threw the Barbitals in Mrs. Fletcher's Chowder? I'm not randomly asking that question, if that wasn't clear, that's the name of the episode. Jeez, spoiler alert, we haven't even met any of the characters and we already know someone laced Jessica's soup. This is a Cabot Cove episode, meaning it takes place in the show's fictional hometown and features a lot of recurring characters like Amos Tupper and Dr. Seth Hazlitt, and there is nothing more I enjoy than seeing these guys interact. The episode is particularly interesting because it gives us a glimpse of Tupper's weird-ass family, including his sister Winnie and her in-laws. There's also a private eye who reminds me of Columbo, and Colleen Camp of Clue fame also makes a guest appearance as a deputy in training. This is also the episode that featured in the modern mystery film Knives Out, I can't even tell you how happy that reference made me. Because this is Murder, She Wrote, it has to begin the episode with something really vague, yet intriguing. Thus, we get second-rate Columbo leering angrily at a bus as an unknown woman exits. She hails a taxi, and he tries to follow her inconspicuously. He actually nearly mows down a pedestrian as he pulls away in his car. Cut to our favorite bumbling sheriff who is telling a woman that he won't be able to get her cat out of a tree since the deputy who used to handle those situations left. This is actually so amusing to me. This series rarely connects their episodes with narrative, each story is super contained, but this time they reference back to the deputy who was bonking all of the older women of Cabot Cove. These episodes are from season 4, which is an amazing season that gave us so many wacky stories. I even covered that salacious deputy episode here on my channel, so if you want to check that one out as well, I'll have a link in the description. Seth gives Tupper a call to see if he wants to grab some lunch. Sheriff's office. Sound kind of peevish. Why don't more people use the word peevish? I'm starting a new segment called Purr's Murder She Wrote Word of the Day, and today it's peevish. Now go use it in a sentence. As they're talking, the unnamed woman walks into the office and she is identified as Winnie, Sheriff Tupper's sister. He is pleased to see her and asks where her husband, Elmo, is. Amos, I left him. Left him? And I heard about your last deputy. <laughs> It's clear from Winnie's dour expression that her husband is not a good person, and she wants to stay in Cabot Cove for the time being. Only thing is, I'm kind of short-handed and won't be able to spend much time with you today. So many cats stuck in trees, it's crazy out there. I'll just walk along the sea cliffs by myself and try not to think about the bleakness of my life. Um... This is awkward. Tupper decides to bother our lovely, hard-working protagonist, Jessica Fletcher, who is trying to meet a deadline for her next book. Tupper introduces her to his sister in hopes that she will keep her company. Your sister? Is she just as annoying as you? Tupper insists that Winnie needs company due to her marital problems, and even though Jess is welcoming to her, she lays down the law and says she can't be sociable right now because she has a deadline. After speaking with Winnie, Jessica sympathizes with her situation and at least invites her to stay for a cup of tea. Amos takes the opportunity to split. Those donuts ain't gonna eat themselves. When Tupper gets back to the office, a woman is waiting for him at his desk. Sheriff Tupper? I'm Marigold Feeney. <laughs> she is there to apply for the deputy job, but Tupper is unsure because she's... a woman. Whoa. Well, I'm not saying that there is, but there could be danger involved. How are you with cats? Damn, Marigold has an intense death glare. Pretty sure lasers are about to shoot out of her eyes any minute now. He makes a quip about his last female deputy retiring to the home, quote, where she belongs, and Marigold calls him out for his blatant sexism. She says she can start right away, so she just... does. And this is how things work in bumfuck nowhere. Winnie tells Jessica that she needed to get away from Elmo because he has changed and has been saying aggressive things akin to wanting to take over the world. I'm really trying to pay attention, but do you see this woman's shirt? That is the second biggest bow I've ever seen. She admits to Jess that he can get physically abusive, then says she is so stressed that she needs to be on ulcer medication. Her husband owns a drugstore, so they're easy to get. Huh. I wonder if this will come back later in the episode. Unfortunately, she forgot to bring her pills, so Jessica decides to introduce Winnie to Dr. Hazlitt. His sister. My, my, my. Oh, God. After some flirtation between these two, Jess explains that Winnie left her prescription in Kentucky. Ulcer? Just a little one, but uh, it does kick up every once in a while. Just like my libido. <laughs> I can take care of that. Seth gets his charm on and shows Winnie around the cute dockside town. You may not be aware of it, 
that Cabot Cove leads the nation for most murders in the world. Hang on, what does that sign say? Secret restaurant? Beep. Oh, Seacrest restaurant. Damn, that doesn't sound as appealing to me. I wanted to eat dinner in secrecy. Without warning, Elmo and his family barge into the office, and Elmo attempts to strangle Tupper Homer Simpson style. He demands to know where his wife is. Despite Tupper knowing this whole family is bad news, he kind of lets them trample all over him and allows them to stay in his home. No idea why, when he made it clear she wanted to be away from them, I would have just kicked them out. He's the sheriff, just arrest them for cripe's sake. The family also enables Elmo's already horrible behavior by giving him bourbon. Seth brings Winnie home, and Mr. Serious Face is still following her. He seems unimpressed by her maniacal laughter. <laughs> Tupper is not happy that it was Seth who spent the evening with his sister and not Jessica, and promptly bats him away. Shoo. No corduroy allowed. Winnie and Elmo... <laughs> Winnie and Elmo. I just cannot take these names seriously. All I can think about is Winnie the Pooh and Elmo the Muppet and now it's weird. During this confrontation, Winnie boldly declares that she wants a divorce. Elmo loses his cool and starts chasing her, so she sneaks away to Seth's house, asking if she can stay with him. Is it okay if I stay here tonight? Yeah? Wow, Seth, you are all bark and no bite. Snooping Man snoops a little more, and it's probably safe to assume that he is a P.I. My god, this case is boring. Seth offers to make her some coffee, but she insists on making it herself, which is... odd. I typically don't walk into someone's house and be like, please, let me use your coffee pot. He decides to call Jess, who cannot catch a break. She tries to ignore it, but... Two rings, I've had it. Seth gets all flustered and tries to get Jessica to look after Winnie. She tells him to get his shit together and deal with it. Meanwhile, at the sheriff's office, and then Eduardo looked up at Sheila with his big chestnut brown eyes, sporting a wind burnt cheek. What are you doing, Rover? Grover. Are you serious? We have a character named Elmo and a character named Grover. What sneaky troll wrote this story? Jess finishes her book and now has free time, so she invites Tupper and Winnie over for breakfast. She also decides to have a dinner party, and Tupper responds very enthusiastically to the idea of a seafood feast. And don't forget your Cabot Cove chowder. That's my favorite. You know, the one with the drugs in it. They decide to invite Winnie's family in the hope of working everything out. Wow, that platter does not look good. With a jarring cut, we also get a scene where Elmo is fighting with the P.I., who is demanding to be paid for his work. What was that all about? I was trying to pay him an exposure! A few minutes later, everyone is ready for Jessica's famous Cabot Cove chowder. Unfortunately, while Jessica is getting the main meal ready, something peculiar happens. Everyone passes the fuck out. Elmo's sister, Flo, didn't eat the chowder, so she thinks the food poisoned them and they must be dead, but Seth determines they're just asleep. What gave it away? Was it the snoring? <laughs> He tells Jess they should try to wake them up. Put one foot in front of that. That's oh. it, you're doing fine. This is a weird trust exercise. So... this guy's dead? <laughs> yep, another one bites the dust. Elmo doesn't wake up like the others, so they try to get him to a hospital. Doc, how is he? Well, he's a little bit dead. Of course, everyone suspects Winnie of lacing the chowder, but Tupper stands up for his sister and says it could be the guy he saw Elmo arguing with before dinner. Tupper sends Marigold to go find him, and she spots him trespassing in Jess's backyard. This goes well. Get lost! Whoa! He explains that Elmo hired him to tail his wife due to insane jealousy and was fighting him over payment, but Tupper is incredulous about his motivation since his client is now dead and he doesn't have any ID. The next day, Seth confirms that the soup was laced with phenobarbitals, begging the question, who threw the barbitals in Mrs. Fletcher's chowder? Jessica asks about the aforementioned drugstore, and when he says Elmo was the president of the family business, a chain of 10 drugstores, then goes on to say that her in-laws all had a role. Flo was in charge of cosmetics, Kenny was a general manager, and Harold was in charge of pharmaceuticals. Does this have anything to do with what happened last night? No, I just really want to know more about your dead husband's family. It's revealed that Elmo took sleeping pills and never leaves home without them, but Tupper couldn't find any pills among his things. The autopsy comes back and confirms his death was from an overdose of the barbitals, but this confuses everyone since the other people who ate the chowder didn't die, they only fell asleep. Seth suddenly remembers he prescribed Winnie some Comitol for her ulcer, which has phenobarbital in it. She comes downstairs at that exact moment to say she needs another bottle. She dropped hers on the bathroom floor and they spilled everywhere. Oh my. The plot thickens. Thick. Like the clam chowder. Marigold does some fantastic detective work, and when I say fantastic work, I mean she found some evidence under a bush and presents it to Tupper. It's the PI's ID. 
I swear, does Tupper do any work in this town? He didn't look in the bushes? What does this man do? The ID matches the PI's story, so he is no longer a suspect. Since he was spying on Elmo and his family, Jess decides to ask him a few questions about them. The PI says that Elmo had an addiction to his sleeping pills and the family likely knew about it, they just didn't give a shit. Jess, being her clever self, confronts Harold, the brother who works the pharmacy, and pretty much corners him. Chemical dependency, Harold. I'm amazed that as a pharmacist, you didn't recognize it, but uh, then maybe you did. You're guessing. I don't think so. Oh yeah, there it is, the famous gotcha line from J.B. Fletcher. I get such satisfaction from those four words. Those four brutal words. I don't think so. I want to do a super cut of every time Jess says that to someone. It'll be my magnum opus. Harold picks up on her implication and invites her back into Tupper's house for a drink and an explanation. Aha. Uh -huh. The golden dragon. It's my own invention. Sir, that's a screwdriver. Harold just kind of rambles about how Elmo always had addiction problems. They got so severe that a lot of the family just ignored it. Then suddenly, Jess has an epiphany. The glass. As she figures out what happened, the murderer saunters into the room. It's Kenny, Elmo's brother, who overheard the conversation and is holding Jessica hostage. Harold has no idea what's going on, so Jess explains that Kenny murdered Elmo by ordering a bourbon on the rocks, slipping the phenobarbital in it while no one was looking, then handing it to Elmo at dinner. Kenny wasn't seen with the drink he had ordered. At dinner, he had a ginger ale. He also put some of the barbital in the chowder to make it seem like that was the cause. Kenny claims that Elmo was ruining the family business and murdering him was the only way to save it. He pulls a knife on Jess and Harold, but Marigold interrupts. Drop it, turkey! Again, what, what is Topper doing? Where is he? I swear, he never solves a single case. As Winnie boards the bus for the ride home, she runs into Ed, the PI, and they kind of connect. Do I know you? Uh, sort of. Your husband owed me money. What a romantic meet cute. Wow, that was a roller coaster of lukewarm emotions. I love the Cabot Cove episodes, and a lot of people remember this one for its zany array of characters and goofy storytelling. It's weird to have this rather serious story about Elmo, someone who is cruel to his wife and suffering from an addiction to drugs, then frequently switch to this rather slapstick subplot with Marigold as the new deputy. Jess takes a back seat to the other characters most of the time, which is fine. I like that Seth and Amos got a little time to shine. I enjoyed Seth enjoying a fleeting romantic moment with Winnie, and I liked learning about Tupper's bizarre family, though they never make another appearance, and neither does Marigold, which is a shame. I thought she would have made a cute addition to the Cabot Cove crew. It would have been nice to have more recurring female characters who weren't just the gossip queens of the town, as shown here. When I first saw this episode, I think my reaction was a little more enthusiastic because I was shocked to see everyone around the dinner table keeled over, but after seeing it again, my reaction is more like... Oh, you. This episode is almost off the rails, not quite. I'd say it's still balancing on it. It's more in line with their typical Murder, She Wrote fair, in that it has some serious parts, some quirky parts, and some campy parts. Now, if you're a Tom Bosley fan, this is the episode for you. There are so many expressions of bafflement to enjoy. If you have an episode of Murder, She Wrote you are just dying to see me talk about, please leave a suggestion in the comments. And until then, happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Murder, She Wrote. I have plenty more on this channel that I'm eager to show you, but first I want to give a hearty thank you to all my patrons. My Patreon campaign really helps me to keep this channel going and motivates me to put out quality content on entertainment that your grandma probably liked. If you can't afford to join or just don't want to, that's okay. Likes, shares, and comments are very satisfying to me. If you want to see more Murder, She Wrote goodness, I have two videos on the screen. On the right, we have the very first episode I did on this series. Highly recommend starting there. And on the left, I have an episode where Jessica dives into virtual reality. I hope you enjoy them. Thanks again, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.